What's going on? Everybody. You've got the cardboard coach here with your boy, Coach Co. And team, we have a very special guest on the podcast here today. We have Mr. Teapot, Tyler Nettencott from the Sports Card Investor. How are you doing today, man? I am great. Really excited to be here. Happy you reached out and um, looking forward to seeing where the combo goes. I am also very excited to have you on. I'm, I'm happy to have you on for several reasons. The first is the fact that you are a diehard collector yeah. um, of a player that I think otherwise goes like unnoticed in the space. Uh, especially because he's a big man and you know we all know the faux pas around big men really not getting much love i mean he, we can look as far as like tim duncan who could yeah. be one of the biggest uh, the greatest big man of all time and just yes some of his stuff is a little pricey but if you compare that to some of the players that play today i mean the kate cunningham's the john morant's the, the people with significantly less accolades uh, you'll definitely see that uh, there's just not as much love. So I want to introduce the fact that you have probably the biggest Drummond, Andre Drummond collection, maybe on the planet. I I feel pretty confident that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and if it's not the biggest, then I need to meet the person who does have the biggest and we need to be friends. And I didn't see if they have any of the prism black one of ones that I'm missing. Uh yeah, I I um I have a huge drumming collection. Um, I've kind of lost track of how many cards. Uh, there's another collector, Clint Capella collector. Um, I believe he's out of Switzerland or maybe Germany, Germany. I want to say Capella's Swiss. Uh, and he keeps track like of every card that he has. So he's really? like he's like I've got 673 out of 685 Capella cards in existence. Like it's crazy. He goes after all of them. Uh, my approach has been a little bit different. I got back into the hobby in uh, really 2019, maybe mid 2019, yeah. after collecting as a kid for many years, and then briefly again for about a year and a half in 2008, 2009. And um, when I got back in, I said, you know, I really want to collect a Pistons player, an active Pistons player. I want to get in and experiment and experience some of this Panini stuff, whatever that is. Yeah. And uh, I looked at the Pistons roster and unfortunately, uh, unfortunately for Pistons fans, their roster for the 2010s was just abysmal. And it was a lot of turnover. Drummond was an all-star. He was their best, most consistent player. He made an impact right as a rookie and came in and was really solid. And I've always liked guys who hustle. I like guys who hustle, who work hard, um, those bangers. And when you look at and, and think about Detroit Pistons basketball, that's what it is. It's yeah. hard work. It's, um, you know, not afraid of contact. It's guys who just put in the effort. And so having grown up, you know, I was a little young while well, I was young, uh, when the Pistons bad boys era was going on. So I kind of was at the tail end of that, just as a kid with my dad, all hyped up on those guys. Yeah. And then, um, you know, went through the Grant Hill era and disappointment of the injury with him and really just liked basketball growing up. I was kind of team anybody, but the bulls, unfortunately, uh, at that time, because they were just winning everything. But my dad was like, we don't like the bulls. We're pistons, you know? So, uh, I was rooting for a lot of other guys, Penny and Shaq, uh, you know, Kemp and, and, uh, Gary Payton was one of my big PCs in the nineties. I mean, you were and, probably pretty happy in the early two thousands then. I, I, that was, those were the best years of my yeah. life. There will never be there will never be a basketball team that I liked more than those going to work Pistons and that starting five. Um, I've been picking up a couple of really cool cards of those guys and those rosters recently, but so yeah, I get back into it and I said, I want to collect Drummond and I was really shocked. I, you know, kind of came across ComC, uh, check out my cards yep. and was looking up their cards and I'm like, I can get all but like two, like the one of ones of Drummond's entire 2018 optic rainbow for like, 42 bucks, the golds, the everything, like he was so cheap. Yeah. And at that time, cards hadn't quite started to go to the moon yet, but he was really cheap. Yeah. So I started scooping those. Then I found the one of ones on Facebook, um, bought those. And then I just kind of got the bug. And then I went, it was like rainbow chasing for all the drumming cards. So a lot of my collection has largely been more of the parallels specifically for Drummond, mm -hmm. not necessarily for other players, more so than trying to get 
every possible patch auto or RPA or anything like that. Yeah. I actually had an NT RPA of Drummond for maybe a three months and I sold it. Um, I really? bought it and then I sold it because I just was like, I don't know. There's so many other cards I'd rather have. It just, just doesn't fit. It just didn't do as much for me. I, it it helped too that um, Jeff, you know, who's my boss, had bought me a really sick immaculate uh, RPA of Drummond. Nice. So I already had a couple cool ones. Yeah, and um, I just wanted to repurpose that money to buy some other some other things. So yeah, that's what I did. But that's kind of the story. It's it's really not super exciting, except to say that I I just kept gone for one of one of one after one of one. This is one of my more recent pickups, uh, which is actually a kind of a funky product one of those buybacks panini replay from 2015 uh but it's a you know one of one buyback rookie auto that was pretty cool that so that's pretty cool lots lots of drummonds at drummond card collector aptly named uh and i always tell people if you want to start a player pc include their name in your instagram handle so that people can find you if they yeah, find that, cool cards that's very true actually first off i want to i want to mention um is it I feel like Ben Big Ben is the only one that's a Hall of Famer. Uh from the from the going to work yeah. guys. Yeah, right now it's Ben Wallace. Uh, Which is crazy because if you were going to tell me get in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like if you were going to tell I, I me think. like in the early 2000s that the only one that would be yeah. in the Hall of Fame right now is Big yeah. Ben, although yeah. like that guy was a monster, but we're talking um, about someone who averaged like 4 points a game. Yeah, Billups is eligible uh now. So he's he's I think he'll get in um, at some point. He was just s- such a leader and he's obviously been in the coaching circuit, but um, yeah, Ben Wallace was just. And he a had monster. a late stint with the Nuggets, correct? Uh, he was with the Bulls and the Cavs. I don't really? know if he was with the Nuggets. He started I feel like with he the was. Wizards. I'm pretty sure he was with the Nuggets. That's so Someone funny. Call me out on that. I'm I'm looking it up now. You you've got yeah, me yeah, yeah. like I'm totally like, curious. I'm like 99% sh- sure actually. Uh that 1% is is what's no nuggets for Ben Wallace. No nuggets. No. Really? No. I was like unless there was a year I just wow. completely forgot. All right. So he was well. he went he was with Washington and then he had a little stint for a year with Orlando before he went to Detroit. Um maybe that's a blue jersey I'm thinking. Then I Chicago, Cleveland and then back to the Pistons where he there you yeah, go. Sort of ran out Talk of to me. Here, but, What's yeah. your favorite parallel of all the parallels you own? Oh gosh. Um it's got to be it's got to be this guy. My 2018 Prism Nebula? Nebula. Nice. Uh just the scope, the color, everything. I mean, true blacks are awesome, super fractors are awesome. I ran an Instagram poll maybe 2 weeks ago and asked what's the best one of one parallel yeah and i said you know super fractor slash gold vinyl true black or nebula and i was shocked like super fractor ran away with it yeah. it was like 68 percent or something said super fractor i did not think that would be the case um to me the prism and if, maybe if i had said prism nebula it would have been a different story because those just hit very differently than I, optic also or like you're comparing spectra. two different uh, yeah like baseball and and basketball slash yeah. football right so yeah. like it's kind of like it's tough to compare the two because yeah. i mean the gold vinyl is number to five and very rarely yeah. will a gold vinyl out outsell like a black right yeah so i, I think it's just like a hard yeah. comparison well to make. it depends if it's this one of the things panini does that kind of drives me batty the gold vinyls in in prism football are number to five but in optic basketball they're one of ones Yes, you're right. So they right, they do right, these wonky right. things where they make the parallels across different sports, like differing rarity, and it drives me crazy. And like Bill, Bill and I talked about this. Like, you know how hard it is for a new collector to get into the space, and like we yeah. can kind of transition like your role with that yeah. because yeah. I'm sure a lot of new collectors find you know the sports card investor page, but like I'm like it, they're it's almost like if someone who never spoke English was learning to speak English, it's yeah. like it, it's the equivalent where yeah you have these base rules, but they except for this and like only in this circumstance and actually, you know, here it doesn't apply, but across yeah. the board, it, it should apply. Right. And it's, I don't know. It's just so interesting. And so like transitioning into that, like, you know, as part of the sports card investor team, uh, you also have your own sub channel, correct? The market movers. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how, how do you find the task of, integrating new, new people into the hobby like how yeah. is that for you and how do you go about tackling that yeah that's a good that's such an important question i think you're right it's like unnecessarily difficult yeah to get up to speed um 
unfortunately, and I, I don't like to sit and like, tot- you know, rip on the manufacturers. There's a lot of things they make the cards that I like, and I like I ultra agree. modern as much as I like old stuff, a lot of it. And I'm appreciative of that and the effort that they put in, and I haven't worked for a manufacturer, so I can't actually speak to the difficulties of doing some of the things they do. But they also do a lot of things that just really make me scratch my head. I just, yeah. it's like, I don't understand the thought process. And I've tried and internally I've been like, get us somebody on the phone from Panini and just have them, there's gotta be a reason for doing this. So explain it. Um, it's been really difficult. So in terms of trying to educate, which is really one of our, chiefly one of our missions at SDI, and I, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about how our content in general has evolved there and, and some of that, but I have a I have a weekly video that I do on our Market Movers channel, and uh, obviously it's just it's sponsored by our data tool Market Movers, but I try to really mix it up, and I, it's really difficult to keep in mind that I could have somebody brand new to the hobby, or somebody who's been watching my videos for two years, yeah. or somebody who's been in the hobby for forty years watching the same video. So to sort of like keep it simple, stupid but also go into some, you know, some concepts and principles that some people might either just be going, yes, yes, that's, I've been saying that and whatever, or hmm, maybe I've never thought about that. Or there's obviously a fair share of like, you're off your rocker, you're a moron, you know, all of that of type of stuff. And you just got to take it in stride. So um, that that's how I generally try to think about it. But one of the things I really try to do is just take time to process and not be afraid to call out things that just don't, make sense to me at the same time. There's a lot of conversation, you know, going back to the nineties, we used to get the Beckett price guides and look at those and say, okay, here's what my card's worth, right? Use that as the baseline easily to trade your cards with your friends. Yep. And that was not complicated. It was like, they gave you the price of the key players. They gave you multipliers of superstars and commons and all this stuff. And you just sort of rolled with it. The hobby's not like that anymore. No. There's, you know, It's all comp, 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 comp. What's the last comp? When did the comp go? How do we comp this? And there's not a lot of actual algorithmic placement into how cards should be priced. And part of that is just because of how dynamic the market is overall, how much perception shifts and perception is what drives price for good or for bad. A lot of times it ends up being hype or, you know, manufactured uh, attention on cards or accidental attention on cards. Um, But there's a lot that goes into that. And so I've made videos, um, Victory Investments on Instagram has a really fun account. He makes a lot of comedy. He raps. He does all these great things. But he also has a lot of um, uh, historical content as well as just really thought-provoking stories. And he put one up one time about over-reliance on comms. And I made a whole video on that. And we were just chatting about that again on Instagram. And it's, it's a really important video, I think, because understanding how do I price a card um, what's a fair price for a card, and then accepting at the end of the day that the card is really just it's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. Yeah, and, that and what you're willing to let, let go of it for, right? Yeah, like it sounds oversimplified, yeah. but every once in a while I have cards that pop up and I go, Well, I know this card last sold in 2019 for eighty dollars, you know. Um, and somebody just listed it on eBay for 140 and Maybe that's too much. Maybe on auction, this would go for 110, but I've never seen it and I'm just going to snatch it. Yeah. And so in reality, that card's worth 140 bucks because yeah. I just paid it, right? Yeah. Um. So somebody else might not be willing to pay one minimum bid increment underneath that. Yeah. Uh, well, like that's if, what if I was tomorrow, to three of them pop up at, at, at like on the market. And, yeah. You yes. know, all of a sudden they start selling for again, right. 80, right. 90, a hundred dollars because yep. those people are willing to part with those cards at those yep. prices. Then that's the new price. Right. Like, yeah. and I find that that definitely is very difficult for people to process. I mean, I have a lot of people ask me like, how do I, you know, how do I f- figure out even like, especially with the influx influx of one of ones these days, right. It's very difficult to price these low numbered parallels, yep. you know, even though there are a lot of them, uh, generally speaking, it's still very challenging to come up with some sort of multiplier for, you know, specific products or specific players. And, you know, oftentimes my suggestion is to just kind of like put it out there like OBO. So like, or best yeah. offer, whatever yes. you're comfortable, yeah. like parting ways with that, like, and like be reasonable, you know, like if you see an out of five or an out of, yeah, if you see an, like an out of 10 sold for, I don't know, $300 and you have an out of five, I mean, it's safe to say your out of five is probably not $5,000. You know what I mean? <laughs> so like not. be reasonable and, and 
you know, come up with a, with a number that you're comfortable selling regardless and, and yeah. leave it open to offers. And I think oftentimes the market kind of decides what it wants to pay. And then you just have to respond whether or not you think that that card is worth more. Yep. And oftentimes you lose your window, you know, if, if, if that's something you're looking to do. But then again, I mean, like, we also kind of need to get out of this frame of mind where we're going to maximize the amount that we're going to get. And we're also going to buy at the very bottom. Right. Like yeah. I find that like being paralyzed by those two, I mean, essentially hyperboles because like, we're never going to get the top and we're not, we're never going to sell the top for very rarely. I mean, I've met a few people that, that were like, Oh, that's my comp. And it's like the yeah. all time high comp. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. I've or, had that a few times and that's yeah, it. That's what yeah. I mean. Like I've known like yeah. maybe two or three people that like uh, in, in certain cases were like, Oh, that's mine. And I'm like, Oh, that's really cool actually. But very rarely, mo most often you'll kind of be in that middle. Right. So yep. it's just kind of about establishing what your, your, the comfort zone is essentially. What yeah, I want to I mean, say. That's, that's oh. spot on. I think when it comes to like rare cards, like one of ones, I know some dealers who have, you know, really come to specialize in those. They're always looking for them. Uh, and that's, that's kind of how they wheel and deal. And they know it's a game of patience yep. and that's the space they're willing to play in. There's so many angles when people are looking to buy and sell sports cards that you can take so many different approaches. And some of them are, um, more appreciated than others by broader, you know, groups of the population, yep. but there are many ways you can go about it. And for people who deal in one of ones, the really cool thing about that when you have somebody who specializes in it is that you'll get to see a whole bunch of eye candy of different things that you would never see if they have a showcase. Yeah. And it's just really cool to see all those cards in one showcase and go, wow, you amassed some really cool stuff here. The flip to it is that very often they're uh, content sitting and waiting for a price that you might go, I that doesn't you know seem right to me. Yeah. But they find people who've got to have that card. They find the Andre Drummond super collector. They find the other person. They find, you know, the Jamar Chase super fan. They they they're really good at tracking down those pe people and building out their network. Um, and so that's that's kind of cool. But it's a game of patience. If you are willing to wait, you, like you said, put it on eBay, put it on a platform, uh, put it on my card post. Shout out to Mark. Uh, and. Okay. Uh, and, um, and, you know, just see, see what kind of offers you get if you are desperate and you need to move it, you know, put it on auction and see what it goes for. Have you been on my card post? Uh, yeah. You yeah. I've trades? talked to Mark. Yeah. He's a great guy. Um, he's got a lot of passion, a lot of energy, and, um, we've chatted several times, been, you know, chatted at card shows and I missed him. I wasn't in Burbank, uh, this last week yeah. had family obligations, but I know he was, I think he was out there. Have you managed to make some trades on the app? Like, have you played around with it or no? Not, not no? yet. Um, he, he got me in there. We, I was giving him a little bit of user feedback on a few things uh, over time, but um, not yet. I haven't. Uh, it's haven't been good so far, man. Stuff. Honestly, like, yeah. and I know that they spawn. I mean, they spawn. It's a great idea, for a reason, man. Like, it's like uh, the biggest thing for me is like providing a safe space to trade. Like, that's Correct. that for me yeah. is like, uh, of course, like having less fees for things is is great. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. But at the end of the day, like, if we can have a safe space to make trades. I think that you, you have no idea what other people and like include cash in these deals, right? There's just so many things that happen at card shows and it's not like to take away the card show experience, but yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people that own pretty cool stuff that if, yeah. if it, if it's seen by the right person to your point about like finding these super collectors, if it's seen by the right person, I mean, you might actually be able to get like the value that you think that this is worth. Right. Yeah. And, and so just, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is not a plug in any way, shape, or form. Actually, like it's just, it's just coming from me actually using it, and I've made yeah. like I made I think two two significant trades so far where I'm like I'm very happy with with the returns, and I'm like, man, you're happy, I'm happy, everyone's happy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I I've talked to Mark several times, and I know, you know, I've I've heard a lot of pitches for different products over the years. Yeah, um, I've talked to a lot of people. I've been to industry summits and the Nick Collective and the National, and you, we hear a lot of different things. I can always tell without somebody having to tell me when the product that they're, you know, involved with is one that was born out of necessity that they wanted and that's why they're doing it yeah. and they're hoping, okay, yeah, maybe I can turn this into a business or a full-time thing or, you know, sell the software or something, but it was because it didn't exist and they wanted it and so they went after it, right? And they sometimes and many times put a significant investment of their own into it to do that to try to share it with the rest of the hobby. You know, whereas there are other products that um are a little more opportunistic and sometimes, you know, driven by people who just 
see opportunity for software and and maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. Maybe there's yeah. demand, maybe there's not. So, I mean, on the topic of software, I, I we we should dive into market movers, right? Like this is is essentially your baby. This is it something is. that you yeah you cultivate regularly. You cultivate it initially, but you continue to cultivate with your with your staff. And I will say that you know, I have to give you your flowers. Early content was, and and we're talking about, first I'll mention the fact that early content in the space in general was, it was all over the place. I mean, it, yeah. I would, I would argue content still is kind of settling in terms of like user. I mean, what people want, right. I yeah, think everyone sure. in the space, because there was so little content in, in the sports card space, I think a lot of people are kind of trying to f- figure out what people want and, what people wanted in the peak of the market was they wanted investment advice and they wanted, I yep. mean, hence why sports card investor was, was created. Right. I mean, that's, that's yeah. what it comes with. Um, I will say that, you know, since bringing you on and, and obviously through the evolution of this content and evolution of market movers as well, I've definitely seen a big difference in terms of what is being pushed out. And it's no longer so much as investment advice and instead kind of like, oh, look at this card, look at this card, like, like, let's talk about this. Why is this card this high? Why is this, why is this card in, in the dumps? Whatever the case may be, which I think is a much healthier space for the hobby. So I, I have to give you kudos for that because I've seen your videos where you're, you know, outright explaining to people, you know, this is you know, this is why this card has ran up and maybe we want to wait and see before buying it and like actually yeah. make those kind of recommendations, Yeah. you know, versus, oh, this guy's hot right now and, and just kind of like leaving it out there where before, even though people kind of wanted that, people really didn't know what they, they, they needed though, you know, just because yeah. it's almost like a kid goes to a grocery store and, they, you know, I want a popsicle. You're like, well, you haven't had dinner yet. You're like, but I want a popsicle. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of like the parent's responsibility to be like, Okay, listen, to, you're, to you're not eating a goddamn popsicle. Yeah. You know, you're, you're you're eating dinner, shut up, right? So yeah, I think that, that that kind of like, and not to say that like sports card investor is like this parental figure now, but because of the notoriety, because of the, the pull in the space, I mentioned a lot of newcomers, I'm sure, fall upon the channel. I think that, you know, what you guys talk about and what you guys post is, is more important now than ever. And so I will say that it's it's nice to see this transition happen uh, while you're at at the helm with the Market Movers app. Yeah, yeah. There's been a lot of changes, and there's a lot to unpack there in terms of um, kind of what that journey has looked like. So, you know, if I take it from the top, you know, uh, Spider Man, right? With great power comes great responsibility. That's correct. Um, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, you know, unto whom much is given, much will be expected. There's, there's a lot of adages and wisdom out there around that. And as sports card investor has grown as a brand, that notion has become more and more and more apparent, uh, to all of us and probably none more, none of us more than Jeff. Um, I had the opportunity to get to know Jeff early when SCI was, was being built and, and grown. I was one of his probably first 100, maybe 50 subscribers by coincidence, maybe on on YouTube when he started the channel. I saw his first video um, and it was at a time when I was hungry for content. I was trying to learn. I had been watching several other you know channels that it had existed for a while. Um, Ty from Breaker Culture was a big one back then. And he's he's gone on and done some great things with Chasing Cardboard and um, with that team. And I was following content. I got in. Jeff's early videos are kind of funny now in hindsight, because it's just like anybody when they start their channel and how it evolves just aesthetically and his personality. Um, And he looked at it as a businessman, as an entrepreneur, as somebody who saw opportunity and said, look, I think this has got a lot of potential to blow up. And there's a lot here. And he kind of had that attitude of like a little bit of day trading, fantasy sports and everything. I know that's polarizing. I will be the first one to say over and over again, you don't have to like it. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. Now, you also might not like what the side effect of that is, right? And how it kind of creeps into the broader culture of the hobby, of the card show experience. You know, hey, I got to have room. I'll buy 70%, all these things, right? That's fine. 
I work with a data tool and sometimes that stuff does kind of drive me crazy, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm just more straightforward and reasonable. Yeah, I'm not just yeah. like choo, 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 kind yeah, of guy, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I'd rather use my data tool and sit behind a screen and snipe something at the last minute than like yeah. get in and lowball somebody over and over and, you know, gaslight them into giving it to me. Yeah. 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 That's um, really my jam. So, <laughs> so it, that is, that stuff does drive us crazy. Right. Yeah. But, but so what happened over time was Jeff never in a million years expected his channel to have the growth that it did and sort of a um, series of fortunate events unfolded. You know, he, he had Charles, who's our head, head of video um, reach out to him. And he was a collector and investor kind of flipper, you know, that had that kind of mindset and worked in video and was like, Hey, why don't you let me come down and help you get a better lighting setup and I'll edit your videos. Charles is still in charge of everything. And he is like the mastermind with his team behind this incredible production quality that we have now. And he really helped Jeff, Jeff grow that brand that way. Um, like it or not, Jeff realized he needed to have a persona. He needed to be a little more dynamic and um, present in, in an exciting way because he really you know, has a lot of enthusiasm for the hobby. And then in about December of 2019, I messaged Jeff on Discord and was like, hey, you know, um, I was a moderator in his Discord server. You have like you should. You're making all these manual charts and graphs. Why don't you like build an app with your software team and get something out? And he's like, I've got something coming. About a month, I'll have beta. I'll get you in there. He gave me access, and I had been working in data management and software, kind of software development, um, data transformation space for a couple of years. Background in finance, all that stuff kind of coalesced and. As I'm, you know, working and helping him fix bugs and sort of doing a little bit of moonlighting work for him, grow the database. I eventually got laid off because of COVID impact to my company. And Jeff brought me on and it was like we just hit the ground running. Obviously, everything went nuclear 2020, 2021. Mm -hmm. Things went to the moon, unsustainably so. I think this is the most important thing. If you go back, Obviously, there's the early sound bites, and you can find them out there about Will Greer and all these other things. And it's actually kind of funny because in those videos, Jeff was literally just referring to Nate Silver's 538 data and saying, based on this, this is what I'm seeing. But they take it out of context and just mm -hmm. throw it in your face, you know, to make him look like uh, look like an idiot. Mm -hmm. And he got very excited, you know, about the way that the hobby was going and growing. And when it all came down, uh, some people see it as still being overly opportunistic that things change, but really it was Jeff having enough humility to pivot. And since then, in many instances and on many podcasts, admit certain mistakes and to say, look, I didn't even realize the impact that the brand had. And that when I was saying, when we were doing kind of like, what would you do, buy, sell, or hold? We were having yeah. fun with that, making these yeah. videos how that might impact other people, how that might make them go buy a decision, like listening to Jim Cramer and go buy a stock and then lose all your money, right? Yeah. They're taking a lot of that corporate social responsibility to heart a lot more. And we shifted and we said, okay, people still want the data. People still like seeing what cards are hot. We're going to report those with a disclaimer. Like this doesn't mean buy them. It just means these people have been hot lately and keep yeah. up on top of the market with the ticker and everything. Mm -hmm. And I, I think all of that's really valuable. Some of those interviews... You know, I've listened, Jeff and I've had so many conversations along with Kelly, who's our VP of content about brand image and what those responsibilities look like to the rest of the hobby and to everybody else. And he's done some of those with, you know, he did a great interview with Jeremy Lee. He did a great interview with sports card therapist. Most recently he did one with Cage Lawyer. Um, and when you see Jeff in those videos, it's a totally different look into him uh, than like the showman that presents yeah. for videos to have yeah. fun, right? So people see all that. From my perspective, we've we've realized over time, and I'm grateful for this. Jeff Jeff has been really encouraging, as has have others on the team, of the importance of having different voices as part of our brand. And so we do cards on the table every Thursday, and we have Doug and myself and Jeff, and then sometimes Ben when one of the other guys is out, sometimes a guest person. And we just talk about hobby news. We talk about my data dive videos. We talk about mailbag questions that people submit. And we have a ton of fun with that. Um, and we just try to be really thoughtful about our responses while giving each other, you know, some, some uh, largely do crap sometimes. And so then when it comes to data dive, like I said, every week, I'm just trying to think about how can I 
show that having data at your fingertips is super valuable, how yeah. you can make educated decisions, how you can find those things that just don't make any sense using some really dorky stuff like, you know, like ratios um, or matching up stats and performances to the prices of cards. And that's really why I'm so passionate about working on market movers all the time with, with a really awesome team to do that because there's so much out there in terms of wanting to aggregate that data and, and give it to people so that they don't make a big mistake. Yeah. Do you, I got a lot of, I actually, yes. Do you ever feel, so, I mean, you have access to all this data. You also have a, a background in analytics, right? Like, do you ever like see a card that's like about to pop off and you're like, man, if, if, if you like acquire a few of these, like I, I can almost bet that in six months or nine months or even two months or a month, like this is probably going to go nuclear. Like the one that I saw recently that everyone's been talking about over the course of the last few days is Justin Jefferson and just kind of like that straight line up over the course of like the last nine months or 12 months, I think. And, um, I mean, that's for me one that I'm like, listen, no matter how good Justin Jefferson is, like, I don't know if he can ever live up to this, right? Like, this is the first time that we've seen a receiver get this kind of love probably since Jerry Rice, you know? And yeah, it's crazy. And like, yes, he's drafted first overall in every fantasy league. Again, I don't know who established this, but the analysts came out and said, Justin Jefferson's your guy, draft him first overall, no yeah. at all costs. And I think this is the first time that we've seen heading into the NFL season, uh, a wide receiver with probably the most hype of any player in the, in the entire league. So I guess my question in all of that is, you know, do you see these trends beforehand? And, and if so, how do you, what's your responsibility to others? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great and loaded question. I definitely have had some instances where I've seen some trends or early and have been able to, you know, capitalize on those. There's a bit of a, um, I don't know, like a double-edged sword for me, but I feel like the people who are most successful in speculation are the ones who are a little bit, and I, I'm going to use this word carefully because it's it's going to sound like the wrong word. They're, they're a little bit reckless in yeah. the sense that they throw what makes sense to the wind and just read, um, they just see the tea leaves for hype because that's what drives this stuff in the short term. I get like a really gross feeling in my stomach with that. Like, I don't, I don't like hype that I see as unsustainable. Yeah. I talk a lot about that in my videos. Yeah. I see those things and feel like I have a responsibility to say, I am very, if I could short this player, I would, if I could short Justin Jefferson, I would. And that's no disrespect to him. He's an incredible athlete, freak, freak wide receiver, but he could come out and this year, I mean, just not be that great. And wide receivers have to have a quarterback who can throw to them. Wide receivers, look at that. He's got like a thumb on Zoom reading. Yeah. That was cool. <laughs> um, they have to have, uh, they have to have uh, a uh, quarterback throwing to them. They have to have an offensive line giving enough protection to that quarterback to get the ball. They have to have an offensive coordinator who, you know, is uh, calling passing plays, which when you have a top wide receiver is usually going to be the case. They have to almost kind of have a defense that's not that great so that you're actually passing a lot in the yeah. game. A lot of things have to fall into place for that. And a, a few years ago, I did a video when everybody was losing their mind over DK Metcalf and his Prism Silver PSA 10 was like $1,600. Yeah. And I just said, guys, I did a whole, I did like, look at the prices of Larry Fitzgerald, of Calvin Johnson, of Antoine DeAndre Hopkins, Hopkins, of DeAndre Hopkins, yeah. of Julio Jones. I ran a poll on Instagram recently and said, will Justin Jefferson be better than Julio Jones. And it was like 78% yes. Will Justin Jefferson be better than Calvin Johnson? Yes. Will Justin In Jefferson career? be better than Larry Fitzgerald? Will have I think it was actually, will he have a better career than Larry Fitzgerald? Yes. And then it was like, finally, Randy Moss. And it was like, no, but it wasn't overwhelmingly no. And I'm like, you guys have lost your mind now. <laughs> so, yes. But I am never throwing all this money into a player like that, especially when the prices are pre-baked. You know what? Yeah. This year, 
Jamar Chase might have a better year than Justin Jefferson. Uh, Jalen Waddle to me is kind of a sleeper. Like some of these guys are really, really, really talented. Um, I love my guy. I'm on Ross St. Brown from the lions. I don't know that he's going to be top, top of the league, but he's a heck of a wide receiver. These guys are really good. And football players in general make me super nervous. The positional players have a really short shelf life. They, uh, many of them tend to be a flash in the pan running backs, especially can't seem to stay more than two, three, four years healthy in the league before they're replaced by another yet, a, you know, set of young legs who can, you know, run real fast. And all that stuff makes me really nervous. And so I find myself focusing a lot of my energy um, into players who are retired or who are proven all-time greats. Uh, There's a guy named Austin Carlson Cards who's kind of found his wheelhouse recently in positional players who were sort of like fantasy all-time greats or iconic defensive players. You know, the Ray Lewis's, these types of guys. And they, and he's and he gets really nice cards of them, and then he's big into Peyton Manning, who you know you could argue is one of the most undervalued, I, underpriced players on planet Earth. For what him he and did. him and Drew Brees are probably yeah, my one doesn't make two, sense, right? Like it's of Tom Brady over those guys just makes no sense to Trevor me. Trevor Lawrence back to to Brady and his longevity. You know, I'm like so this is... so uh, it's just there's there's a lot in that, and I I find myself like resisting the temptation to make every single week's video about that dynamic like, and that's and that's kind of why i asked it right it's like what's he, your responsibility like yeah. i know that because no one wants to hear that like your cards are never going to go up because they actually might like i mean yeah. and realistically like that's part of the fun a lot of people are having with collecting yeah. ultra modern it's yeah. that the fact that there is this ability there is this hype they want that hype they want to they want to be the person who owns it as that person starts to achieve things, yeah. right? Like they want to have an Aaron judge card when he hits that, that home run to, to break the record, right? Like that's, that's what they want. It's that if you get enough people who buy into the idea that a guy is already worth a certain amount or is going to be worth a certain amount, um, many times that can set sort of an artificial floor on those players I, too, which is sort of like a trap door. I call it a trap door because it's sort of like everybody's holding, 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 and then enough time goes by and it's like, nah, this guy really stinks. And the bottom just falls. Every, there's a liquidation event. Everybody just needs to get out of those cards. And you know, I think of guys like Baker Mayfield, Sam Darnold. These prices were like, hold, hold. And then they just, you know, kind of yeah. like, oh gosh, this guy wasn't what we thought. So yeah, football is really interesting in that regard, um, you know, to kind of look at the way some of those things unfold and yeah, I, I think it's I think it's really important to call those out. I I've done some fun videos where you just sort of stack out like what's the best case and worst case scenario maybe for this player. Uh maybe best case, worst case, and like middle, most probable, if you were like, you know, putting them on an average uh, uh, line. Yeah. And and then to look at those players' cards and their most valuable ones and their sort of iconic ones and where do those fall? And you just it's very sobering. It's very sobering to look at that and go it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if Justin Jefferson's better than Randy Moss because right now his cards are more expensive than Randy Moss's cards. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I find that that's kind of like, I collect mainly hockey and, and like vintage soccer stickers and soccer stickers. Like I, if I find something cool, I'll pay basically whatever it is. And like, as long as, long as I'm, if I've seen a few of them then I'm like, mm, okay, I'm probably not paying, you know, that price that you yeah. have listed, but especially when it comes to hockey, like there's a lot of all time greats that just like their, their prices just don't really make much sense in comparison to like a lot of the players that are playing yeah. now. And like, I definitely struggle where I'm like, okay, wait a second. Like, you know, Steve Eisenman's PSA 10 is, and there's only like 20 of these, you know, and there's from 1984 and it's this price, but for some reason, you know, and Connor McDavid is an amazing player. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I'm like, but some reason Connor McDavid's prices are like half of that, you know? And I'm like, how does this add up? What does yeah. he need to do over the course of his career? And I mean, he's already had a ton of Art Rosses and he's already, you know, cemented himself as I would say like a top 50 player of all time, potentially. So, I mean, he's already well on his way and the more accolades he, he acquires, I mean, the more and more that, that price will, will become more and more legitimate. Right. But yeah, well, there's something, there's something to being one of the, one of the top two or three best players from your era. Yeah. Um, that's true. That's, that's one of the, 
that's one of the little stories that I pinned in my hobby truths. Some of them I make a little playful, right? I'm like, let's stop overusing goat, like greatest yeah. of all time. Yeah, he's not. He's not. He's one of the goats. It's like, yeah, okay. I I switch. I just said let let's do greatest of this era or greatest of their era. G O T E. Yeah, so be a little playful with it, but like, yes, show respect to certain guys. McDavid is the guy right now. You of course, know, he is um, undeniably, undeniably, and yeah. you no, know, and so then you look at that across other sports too, and you sort of laser in on those few players. And then you look at the rest, it, it's not hard. Just go back to the 2000s or the 90s or the 80s or whatever you remember most fondly and think about the, the best players who existed then and how many of their cards. I like, like that a lot. How many of them you've just forgotten about? The video I did this last Saturday on the Market Movers channel uh, was a video I called like the ultimate collector method. And it's all about going back to the stats and the, uh, the awards, all NBA first team, all, you know, all, all pro, all whatever points for game leaders, you know, rushing yards leaders and creating, turning your nine page binder book into like a catalog of history of the ones who really did it great. Even if it was for a season, yeah. that's really cool to remember and acknowledge, you know, this guy had, he had one go, he gave it his best. He got injured. He just didn't, couldn't pan out, whatever. It's fun to go back and remember some of those players and, and in some of the performances that they had. Are you, so uh, recently I mean, you, you just discussed some of your hobby truths. That's actually one of the reasons why I was like, I want to have this man on the podcast because I, I love the idea of like having some of these hobby truths and a lot of them really resonated with me. Um, you know, for instance, I want to talk about this one. If you don't mind me reading it, it I have a screenshot. It, he said, it's true that record sales are promoted regularly by businesses and influencers. Uh, but every time a card plummets in value and has a massive crash, there are just as many or more people celebrating it and ridiculing the, the fools who bought high. Um, essentially, I mean, you also, the, the whole purpose of that was talking about how empathy matters and, you know, really being able to empathize with these people and not just kind of, uh, celebrating the fact that these people got shorted or, you know, whatever the case may be. First of all, do you want to kind of touch on that subject and then we can go into the hobby truths in general? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty active on Instagram. It's the only social media platform that I'm on because it's already way too much. And, yeah. <laughs> and it's the most visual, you know, of the ones in my, in my opinion. So that's why I gravitated toward it because cards are visual and I've made some really great connections and some great hobby friends through Instagram. And, and even some people I would just consider friends now, you know, even out independent of the hobby. Yeah. And um, there's just a lot right? You're, you're creating content. Everybody's creating content. People put their thoughts out there. It's cool. It's kind of cool that we live in a world where you can do that. It's also kind of maddening. And I had a, a bit of an epiphany recently. I'm driving home with my wife and I'm like, you know what? The problem with social media is that these are the thoughts that most of the times would have just stayed in somebody's head. Yeah. They, they might not have even made it out to anybody. And if they did, it would have been like a best friend or a significant other or somebody like that, right? But now it's so easy to just type up a little post and just throw something out there into the ether for your followers, you know, your lemmings, your people to, <laughs> to see your echo chamber or your yeah. hater. Yeah. And, 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 you, and, and to get some kudos. Feedback. Is, hold your breath moment, right? Yeah. I put it out there. Ooh, what's going to happen now? You know, um, is anybody going to fight me? Is anybody going to, you know, is anybody going to tag me in their story now and start a war? Am I going to get all the time. Am I going to get told that that's so insightful and it's amazing and whatever? So I sort of play the game of a lot of times just sit back and observe, see what people are saying, and to really try to consider what they're saying. Um, many times, probably more than they did, honestly. And just process, process. What is their merit to this? If so, how so? What's the devil's advocate position? Like suss it out, meet out the the, the real substance of what's being done. Yeah. And a lot of times that comes down to a handful of things. One of them I talked on one of Jeff's podcast episodes not too long ago about, which is like making critical distinctions and people seeming to lack the ability to make critical distinctions about something that is completely illegal and immoral and wretched and whatever, all the way down to something that is no more than personal preference. Yeah. And you just believing that you think this particular parallel is the best parallel on earth and everything else is trash. And so 
we should hate on the manufacturers and we should do all this ne negative stuff. And that's sort of at the crux of like the hobby negativity, positivity. It's like a this false dichotomy, I think, that gets put out there. Yeah. Um, you know, but then the other the other possibility is you just have like all these people telling you how much they love what you said. You get that little dopamine rush. It feels good and you feel validated. Um, and and that, you know, that's there's nothing wrong with that. The the flip though is it turns into so many wars and things, right? And that's that's sort of at the essence of why I made that post. It's not, I'm not of some like um, illusion that putting a post out, uh, when I have a few thousand followers and, you know, maybe three, 400 people see an Instagram story that I'm somehow going to change the world or change, you know, anything really, mm -hmm. but it, there is still something about, um, saving that. And I put it into, you know, one of those little highlights on my thing to almost so I can refer back to it, like journaling, right. That at this point in time on this date, this is what was going through my head. And it is that, there's people who like to celebrate the high cards and it's cool and it's fun and it's exciting. It's like, wow, that card's really impressive. And other people like to hate on those sales. Like, oh, that's just going to come crashing down. And then the flip happens. And there's people who just want to like crap all over everybody uh, for no reason, really. Like, look how hard this card crashed down. It's like, yeah, maybe some of the people who bought high um, deserved to lose big because they were part of the pump scheme or whatever type of thing happened. But probably not. There's probably somebody who, you know, um, thought they were getting a good deal or thought that the card was going to keep going up or got told by somebody that they should buy the card or got tricked or who, I don't know. Maybe it's just an honest purchase. Don't you at think the a lot of this has to, I'm sorry you know? to interrupt you, Ryan. Yeah, no, it's just, the, the, go, go ahead. Don't you think a lot of this has to do with just a lack of education? It does. Like, right? Yeah. And, that, and that's like, I think the thing I struggle with the most in this space is that like, I... I don't know if education, if if the 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 lack of attention towards education is because that volatility is so enticing, and the minute that there's like new, like a, a baseline education for everybody, yeah, that you're you're gonna lose a lot of that volatility, right? Because it's everybody knows that you know when a card first comes out and it shoots straight up to the moon. I mean, we've seen it happen with like the Mac Jones and the Wander Francos and the, you know, ev almost every single set has like a player. Yep. And you can put a star next to it and say, revert back to this card from release and a month, a year later. And I can bet my firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, every single thing I own that it's probably going to be lower. Right. Um, and again, we talked about this earlier. Like a lot, some people like being part of that hype. They, you know, they want to have that guy, uh, while he's playing, while he's he's memorable, while and that stuff is fine, because those people don't give a shit that it, their cards are down, yep, sixty five percent. Those yeah. people don't give, you know, they don't care that their card is down sixty five percent. I've had these conversations with people. I'm like, well, how could you not care? You could actually have saved money. They're like, I don't care. And I'm like, okay, cool. There's a whole sect of the hobby that just does not care. They don't care about like timing. They don't it's care about patience. Right. They're just like, I wanted to own it yeah. when I wanted to own it. And I don't give a shit about like yeah. saving money here done. And I'm like, okay, cool. Move yeah. on. You yeah. know, now but go there's... back to the critical distinction. Is yeah. that wretched and immoral or is that just their preference? I think it's just, I mean, it's, it's just, just their preference. Preference. It's preference. You know? Of course. As long as they're not being financially irresponsible with family members who yes. depend on them. Right. Yes then who cares? Who cares I, what they do with their money? I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with you. And then, I mean, to your point, if someone did get like dunked on and something is down 90%, I mean, should we be, and I mean, I've definitely fallen victim to this too. I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, stuff that is easy to consume, stuff that, you know, could potentially heed as a warning for other people for future products. Yeah. I don't know what the cool off period is or, you know, like, do you give it some grace period before you, you say, okay, look, let's, we need to talk about the fact that this happened again. Right. So I, I definitely, and that's, that's something that resonated with me. Cause I mean, I try to be empathetic as much as possible. I mean, we, I think we can all be a little bit more empathetic based on when we start hearing more and more people's opinions or less opinions and more like life experience. Right. Yeah. So substance. I, I agree. I don't know. 
I, I think that at having more education in this space would definitely allow for the people who wanted to make those decisions at that price point, And they were like, I don't care about price. I'm not going to sell this card. So it doesn't matter to me. Yeah. I have no problem with those people paying up for things. That's, that's normal. That's the normal supply and demand, right? But it's those people that are buying in with this idea that there were someone was in their ear or they watched a piece of content or they walked by a dealer and they're like, this guy's hot or everybody else was, was let's all aboard the, the, the hype train, knowing full well that these people kind of had like a, a, a marker in mind when they were going to sell, right? Like uh, they knew exactly when they were going to jump off the tracks. It's like, you know, telling a friend that you were going to go, Hey, do you want to jump on the train with me? We're going to go to, I don't know, Idaho. And they get off well before that. And they don't tell you, right? So I th I think that is, you know, if we can solve that, I think I'd be much happier with uh, other people in the space. I think it'd be a lot easier. I think it'd be less of a of an issue to talk about when cards go down like that because the people who have them, like we just said, don't care, yep. right? It's like, it's you... You actually have the ability then to be a little less. I'm not saying like sh absolutely shit on the people who held, but you have the ability to kind of like, let's kind of joke about this. And like when you have enough wins, you're allowed, you you can joke about this. Like, I mean, I'm sure you, you've bought things at, at inopportune times. I know I have oh, where, I mean, yeah. I'm still holding that thing that I'm like, ah, you know what, whatever. I didn't have to, I don't have to sell this thing. It's kind of like a cool reminder, like just, you know, right. Yeah, it's my uh, it's my diploma from graduating from <laughs> stupidity. The school of hard knocks <laughs> from FOMO, from this FOMO or the school of uh, false opportunity. Yeah, um, a lot. Yeah, a lot of really important things you said there, and and education is huge. Um, I uh, am really excited because I've had an opportunity with uh, some of my team to be working on a project that I can't, uh, I can't disclose yet. And I'm not trying to say that to be like, Ooh, look at me, but it, no, no, there's okay. something really cool coming. That's, that is all about education for the hobby. Um, and, and for people interested in getting into cards and doing those things that is going to be, um, one, one of the, one of the more exciting and, uh, things that I'll be grateful for having been able to, to be in the hobby and to do. And then we did the, um, Sports Card Investor University yeah. video series. Yeah. There's a playlist on our channel for that. And it's there's these great, you know, sort of deep dive videos by sport to understand key sets, manufacturers, what to do, what not to do. Um, we've done videos on how not to get scammed. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of different education on our channels about that. And that's something that we really strive to do. Like you said, there are plenty of people who don't care at all about losing money on cards. They're in it for the excitement. Um, there's obviously a massive audience of people who buy into breaks yep. all the time, nonstop. That's how they like to spend their money. It's a thrill of a chase. It's exciting. Some of them do well on it. Some of them don't. Again, without trying to get into specific circumstances of whether or not they have the money to be doing it, they shouldn't be if they don't. There's a lot, that's a huge audience. And that's their prerogative. I know yeah. a lot of people don't like that. That's sort of a spicy take to be like, well, breaking's fine. I think it's fine. I I think it's totally fine. If we don't ever open the wax, then we don't ever get the cards in the wax. I can't buy uh, the singles. <laughs> I like to buy singles. I like to open boxes. It's such a, it's like, I go back to my childhood doing it every time. It's very exciting. I don't do it often because it's not a great value proposition. Um, the second piece to that truth that you, you know, that hobby truth that I posted the next slide over from that was sort of like the bookend to that, which is while empathy does matter a lot, so does personal accountability and personal ownership. And this is a lot of what you're talking about. It's if you make a bad play, you know, own it. If you listen to somebody else, don't blame them. You made the purchase. Nobody, I hope, held the gun to your head and said, hey, you better buy this card. You know, maybe you got tricked. Maybe you got scammed. Maybe whatever. Talk to anybody who's been in the hobby for a couple of years, at least. And we it's happened to all of us. There's like yep. no way to avoid it. No, no amount of education can set you up to protect you from every possible thing. But for those people who do have the energy and the determination to have a voice in the hobby, 
I do think there's really something important about that, at least interjecting periodically these um, nuggets of, you know, truth of, of wisdom of, um, you know, learning and, and how to make uh, really good decisions so that you don't have any, um, you know, unavoidable or, or otherwise avoidable regret, I should say. I think it's fantastic. And I want you to continue to share those hobby truths whenever they so pop in your head as you drive home. Tyler, I want you to let the people know where can they find you? Uh, where can they ask you questions? Where can they see your your Drummond PC? Uh, you know, really, where can they consume more teapot? Yeah, um, for sure. At Drummond Card Collector, um, at teapots underscore cards, uh, at Stadium Club Cards. I try to compartmentalize Ooh. different collections uh, on Instagram. So that's all linked on my main IG account. Um, and if you're interested in more of those, uh, I guess, personal musings, hobby truths, as I've, I've called them, uh, they're in, you know, saved in a highlight on Instagram, but, uh, check out the market movers, YouTube channel, as well as the sports card investor channel. Would love to, to have people over there and leave comments, um, reach out, connect with me. I really enjoy, I'm busy. I have four kids, seven and under and work a lot and do all kinds of crazy things. But when I can, I like to get back to people and, you know, try to try to engage and not leave them hanging. And, um, I was, you know, a little nervous having the unenvi unenviable task of following uh, the one and only Bill <laughs> Evis pitch on the last video. Bill's a Bill's a local Atlanta guy, yeah. And he and I have gotten to know each other, and we we have a lot of candid conversations. He um he's got that dog in him, as they say. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, I'm more of the uh, diplomat, and yeah. uh, I like to um I like to rib him on certain things. We definitely do not always agree. Uh, sometimes we agree on the substance of something, but not yeah. necessarily the approach or how to affect change. But we have a lot of really good conversations. And um you've had some other great people on, you know, some of my favorite people, Adam, real 27 guy, he's, Mama Breaks. He's another one that's they're awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, Daryl, who's another Atlanta guy, Dr. Collectible. Yes. Yes. So you're you're making the I, Atlanta circuit. I got I got to head out to Culture uh, Collision. Apparently, that's what that's what that's what's yeah, going so, on. So enjoyed enjoyed being on here. I've got a I've got a parting question for you. Go for it, man. Maybe nobody's ever asked you. I don't know if any guests turn the tables on you. And Very say, rarely. Yes, but you know I see all your weights, Coach Co. Yeah. Fit. So you you give me your top five exercises that somebody would do if they if you said if you're only going to do five things, do these five things. Okay. Uh, I'll try to listen in order, maybe. Okay. Number one is walk. Easiest exercise you anyone could possibly do. It's free. It's great for your cardiovascular health. It's very low impact. There's, there are, the list of reasons why you cannot walk is so small in comparison to and and you know if you're listening to this and you're impacted by that, forgive me. But this is the easiest thing that most people can do is walk and costs zero dollars, just time and energy. Went for a nope. family walk tonight. There you go. There you go. Great for your mental health. I do it every single morning. Number two, I'd say squat. Again, doesn't have to be anything fancy, but we're talking about full body movement where you're using your glutes, your hamstrings, uh, affecting your posture. Uh, number three would probably be the exercise that is done, uh, I would say, wrong the most. <laughs> As someone who's been trainer for about 10 years is, and it's probably, it's a hinge of some kind. So whether that's a deadlift, whether that is a good morning, uh, any sort of hinge, I think is kind of critical for preservation of the lower back. And oftentimes people are kind of scared of doing yeah. any sort of hinging motion, but it's actually like the movement is medicine. So like building that up with body weight, uh, you know, practicing bending over and picking your kid up. Like this is a movement that you can't really avoid. Like this is like an everyday thing and that if you just eliminate that i mean obviously eventually you're going to get hurt if you attempt it right so uh, i'm very much of the like movement pattern so find a movement pattern that you would have to do in everyday life i would throw a lunge in there too i think most of the exercises i'm going to say are lower body focused because the lower body is just so critical in in moving the rest of you so whether that means that uh it's like building overall strength so like trunk stability which i think is so critical uh, or just from a sheer caloric perspective, I mean, your legs account for half of your body versus like, if you're doing bicep curls, like that is such a very small portion of, uh, of proportion in terms of like the rest of you, uh, I'd probably finish it off. So I'd say like lunges for, and, uh, I throw like any sort of row 
as a number five. Again, strengthening your your back is critical. I mean, if you look at how most people age, it's kind of forward. And, you know, the more time we spend oh, it's true. sitting in front of TVs, in front of computer screens, in front of phones and watches now. And I mean, it's kind of at such a young age too, where you're in school and yeah. your entire, our entire lives are kind of hunched forward. Right. So if you don't want to wilt over time, I mean, you naturally have to do the opposite and that is kind of rolling. So if I had to drop five on you, that that's what it would be. Gave you the reasons too. So hopefully that helps get someone started to some capacity. Good. Yeah, it's good. One of my, you know, the last hobby truth I dropped was cards aren't everything. No. You know? And, and no. in fact, hopefully they're not even close to the biggest things in your life because life's a lot more important than that. And um, yeah. I agree. I agree. I mean, there's a lot of times where I have conversations with people in the space where I'm like, listen, like you're making all these, all this money in sports cards, but like, like what is, what's going to happen? You know, like, and I'm not trying to change. Like these are people that are very close with in the space. And I'm like, I mean, maybe we should start talking about walking, you know, yeah. just, just getting out there. So I mean, if there's one thing you take from this conversation, number one, is that, I mean, obviously Tyler is just a wonderful individual in the space with chock full of knowledge, but also maybe right after this episode or during this episode or whatever, tomorrow you decide to go for a walk or get something going for you and uh, the other people in your life that you care about. So yeah. Tyler, I want to thank you again, man. Uh, appreciate you and uh, team. I hope you enjoy this week's episode of the cardboard coach cart. Coach Co and Teapot are out of here.